Good morning, everyone. And how are you doing today? I am Audra Mitchell, your host for today's session. And as usual, I'm really excited that you've chosen to join us as we explore a topic today, hypertension and stroke. So hypertension or high blood pressure is when your blood pressure is higher than normal and is also referred to as a silent killer because it shows no symptoms. According to the World Health Organization in a study done in 2015, one in four men and one in five women have hypertension or had hypertension. And they also said, however, sadly, that fewer than one in five people with hypertension have it under control. And that can be me, that's many of us who will be listening here today. And that's why we find it extremely important because as I welcome back and introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Nicola Alcala, and she takes you through today's session. You know, she's going to certainly show us and, and share with us the importance of getting this under control. And, and because of the impact it has not only on us, but on our families. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. For those of you who joined us when we had our diabetes <coughs> session, Dr. Alcala was our presenter. So it is a pleasure to have her join us back again. So Dr. Nicola Alcala is a general practitioner and diabetologist. She's a graduate of the University of the West Indies Muna and Cave Hill campuses, where she studied medicine and chemistry. And she's also a graduate of Cardiff University in Wales. She previously worked in gerontology in the St. James Medical Complex in Trinidad and Tobago and in early phase clinical drug development in the UK. Dr. Alcala has practiced yoga for a number of years and is also a yoga instructor, and she's a very good one at that. I can vouch for her. So, Dr. Alcala, without further ado, because you know, I really want to ensure we spend the time hearing from you on this topic, you know, and, and, and in the space of sharing, you know, I, I um, suffer from high blood pressure, you know, so this topic is very present to me, very real to me, and I know about having to control it. And I know what happens when you don't control it. So, Dr. Alcala, it is our pleasure to welcome you back and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Audra. Nice to see you again. Thank you for Marcy to have me um, back here this morning. And um, our discussion this morning will be high blood pressure, um, the silent killer. You know, in Trinidad and through the Caribbean, um, we say pressure. So um, patients come in and say, doctor, I have pressure. And, you know, I, sometimes I have to ask, when you say you have pressure, are we talking high blood pressure or you're under pressure? So um, the main takeaway of this um, talk today is for you to actually understand that it is a silent killer. That is the point that I want you to go away with and to understand how important it is, especially as you get older, to do regular annual checks with your family doctor. Next slide. So in Trinidad and Tobago, it's estimated between 25 to 30 percent of persons have high blood pressure. Um, Globally, about one in five adults have high blood pressure. So that's about 20%. And high blood pressure causes about 50% of all deaths from stroke and heart disease. In Trinidad and Tobago, the cost of healthcare services and loss in productivity, which is very important because we don't often consider the indirect costs to Trinidad and Tobago uh, is about 3.3 billion TT dollars, especially in our setting where our medication is provided. A lot of the medication is provided free for high blood pressure. Um, our costs are very high. Um, I'll just say a little bit about hypertension in other countries throughout the Caribbean because um, <clears throat> our, our um, Surveys in Trinidad showed about 25 to 30 percent, but the WHO, um, if you look at their percentages, you'll see about 20, 21 percent. So Trinidad and Barbados have similar percentages. Uh, Jamaica is a little higher, 25, 
um, countries such as St. Kitts, British Virgin Islands and Grenada, between 35 to 38% of their population has hypertension. And through Latin America, the percentages are, are even higher in cities across, uh, we looked at a study across Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, about 42% of population had high blood pressure and about 63% were aware of their disease. So that's about a third of patients not being aware that they were hypertensive. Next slide. So what exactly is high blood pressure? We, we talk about it and um, you know we don't really know what it is. So blood pressure is the pressure literally of your blood pushing against the walls of your arteries. Your arteries are the blood vessels that carry blood from your heart to other parts of your body. So your veins bring blood that has um, been, ha that has had its oxygen removed to the heart, comes to the heart, goes to the lungs, gets oxygenated. That blood comes back from the lungs to the heart and that gets pumped via the arteries throughout your entire body. So in saying that blood pressure is determined by the amount of blood your heart pumps and by the resistance to blood flow in your arteries. So if you have high resistance of the arteries in the body, you think about it, the heart has to pump against high resistance. And if you have large amounts of blood, larger amount, for example, in pregnancy, your blood, your heart has to pump a larger volume of blood. So high resistance to blood flow means what? You think of it literally like a pipe. When you have high resistance, what happens in a, in a, in a pipe? You're trying to force blood or force water through a narrow tube. And in order to try and overcome this, sometimes, artery, sometimes a pipe bursts. In this case, your arteries get damaged because you have this high blood pressure hitting the sides and walls of these arteries in an attempt to flow through the arteries and, and get the blood and oxygen to other parts of the body. So there's a forcing through these narrowed blood vessels. So what are some of the risk factors for hypertension? I always like to divide this into modifiable and non-modifiable. So modifiable, the things we can change and non-modifiable, unfortunately, the things that we can't. So the modifiable um, risk factors are smoking, lack of exercise, obesity, excessive alcohol consumption. Now, lack of exercise doesn't necessarily mean someone will be obese. Very slim people because of genetics, uh, lack of exercise um, can cause, uh, you can still have hypertension even when you are very slim. Um, so it's a, quite often a misconception that people think that, well, I'm slim, I can't get high blood pressure. And that is, that is totally incorrect. A lack of exercise in a slim person can still result in high blood pressure. Um, I put pregnancy under modifiable, you know, because you can or you can't be pregnant. And then chronic stress is a big factor for high blood pressure. And the reason for that is multifactorial, um, from mental to the effect of stress, which in itself is a disease on the body and the release of certain hormones which contribute to uh, high blood pressure. So non-modifiable, I put pre-existing medical conditions, even though these can go under modifiable. Um, why I put them under mo non-modifiable? Because I was looking here at the person who already had high cholesterol, diabetes, and in particular kidney disease, which is you know, a patient who already has kidney disease or going into kidney failure and develops hypertension, there's very little sometimes we can do about the kidney failure. Um, in the, and in patients who are, are diabetic, for, for example, managing your diabetes doesn't necessarily mean that your blood pressure will improve unless your diabetes is driven by obesity. So that if you're able to modify your weight, 
loss of weight causes your blood pressure to lower and has an effect on diabetes. So the pre-existing medical conditions, you know, are kind of hybrid. Then we have genetics. So um, an, an immediate family history of hypertension, quite often we see parents um, or siblings and, you know, I always say to people, you may have a genetic history, but that doesn't mean that you have to get hypertension or diabetes or any of the um, lifestyle illnesses, but it definitely predisposes you. Ethnicity, um, people of African origin um, tend to have um, higher risk of hypertension in earlier age groups and can have worse complications than other ethnicities um, in, 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 in the younger age groups as well. Um, in some, we, in the Caribbean is very varied, so, uh, and through Latin America, and, and we find that um, some countries are predominantly Afro origin. A country like Trinidad and Tobago is so multicultural. Um, when we say Afro, many times our Afro is mixed, and Afro mixed can have a, a, a different course of hypertension. So it can get quite complex. Um, early menopause is a risk, and this goes again to um, the loss of estrogen, um, where estrogen is a protector um, for women against heart disease, high blood pressure. And age, now I have to say something about age, because as you get older, regardless of, of everything we discussed, you're more at risk of becoming hypertension. You could have been well and healthy before, no history, aging organs and aging can predispose you to hypertension on its own. Um, and in less than 15 years, there will be globally more people age older than 60 than children under 10. And I don't think, um, you know, we are paying as much attention to the aging of the population and what that is going to mean and what the burden of care is going to be with regard to hypertension. So there's a certain amount of responsibility that we have to take for our health. Next. So what are the complications of hypertension? High blood pressure, as I said at the beginning, damages your blood vessels and your blood vessels are your, are, are your life conduits. Everything is taken around the body by your blood vessels. Oxygen, the micronutrients of, uh, of the food that you eat, everything, that's what you're dependent on. So when these blood vessels are um, destroyed or damaged, what happens? Stroke. Um, where we can have bleeding into the brain, loss of vision, the blood vessels to the eyes are damaged, so blindness, heart failure, heart attacks, um, kidney disease, kidney failure, um, sexual dysfunction, uh, in both men and women actually, because for men, it's more visible in the form of erectile dysfunction. Um, in women, because with hypertension, you, there tends to be a, a predisposition to diabetes and a whole change in your metabolism. Um, it actually worsens destruction of your blood vessels and you can then develop diabetes, which is also a disease that damages blood vessels. That... Um, that combination of high blood pressure and diabetes is, is, is often seen and is, is very relevant because, I don't, because people don't understand how one can lead to the other. And it is because of the damage that high blood pressure causes to the um, blood vessels together with other issues um, in diabetes. Next. So some of the other complications would be, I'll, I'll deal with aneurysm first because aneurysm is a sudden rupture of a weakened artery. Um, which usually leads to death. Now, any artery in your body can have an aneurysm, any, any artery. Um, the commonest we'll hear about would be in the brain or um, in the, they can have an aneurysm in your heart or in the arteries leading 
away from the heart. And usually when these um, arteries rupture, if they, if they rupture with no warning signs, which is something that happens in the brain, um, you, you know, it's usually instant death. Vascular dementia, um, I know we would use the term dementia. Um, many people think, you know, senile dementia, as you get older, you get shrinkage of your brain, etc. But vascular dementia, is as a result of the blood vessels in your brain actually being damaged. So you're losing that blood supply to the brain. So diabetes, as we discussed, and pregnancy. Pregnancy is actually a risk factor for many diseases for women during and post. So pregnancy puts women at risk for high blood pressure, diabetes in particular, where you have gestational, meaning in pregnancy, hypertension or diabetes. Pregnant, um, hypertension and diabetes can cause poor fetal growth resulting in small babies, premature labor, maternal seizures, death, and a condition called DIC, which is uncontrolled bleeding, leading to death of baby and mother. Um, women who tend to have these seizures, when it reaches the seizures, which we call eclampsia, you know, when they come out of it, there's a loss of memory and a difficulty uh, uh, um, with focus and concentration later on. And many women who become hypertensive in pregnancy inevitably become hypertensive later on in life, very similar to diabetes. Next, so we're classifying hypertension as primary or essential where no cause is found and there's often a family history. Um, secondary would mean that there is something happening that is causing the blood pressure to go up. So kidney disease, adrenal gland tumors. The adrenal glands are glands that sit on top of the kidney and they produce adrenaline. And you can have adrenal gland tumors uh, where the glands produce high levels of adrenaline and that level, constant level, high levels of adrenaline causes hypertension. Um, I've actually seen this a, a couple of times and you tend to see this in young people. Thyroid disease, overactive thyroid can lead to hypertension. Very important, certain medications. And um, people tend to take these medications without thinking often, um, especially cold remedies and decongestions, over-the-counter pain relievers. So <clears throat> one of the things I always have to remind my patients who are hypertensive, if you have a cold or so, always speak to the pharmacist. Never take something off the shelf because you may read the ingredients and think, oh, well, fine, this is fine. Mm -hmm. But one of those ingredients can raise your blood pressure or cause your heart to race. Some antihistamines do the same. Um, birth control pills can as well. That's one of the complications of birth control pills. And actually, um, in high blood pressure, I tend to avoid um, the use of high of birth control pills in people who have high blood pressure, even though some doctors will use. The newer pills are better. And some prescription drugs, like um, some of the antidepressants. Illegal drugs like cocaine and amphetamines can cause high blood pressure. And sleep apnea, very important risk factor. Because when you have sleep apnea, which leads to snoring, sleep apnea is when the airway closes, you snore, but in the closing of the airway, it blocks oxygen and affects blood flow to your heart and brain. And um, sleep apnea actually affects the heart, can cause arrhythmias and can result in heart attack or heart disease in the, uh, in the long term. Good, so I put this slide up a little bit technical the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, high blood pressure is a very complex disease, and many times, you know, we we um, you know just think we have a little bit of pressure, but it's very complex. And why I put this down up is because the medications that we'll talk to talk about later, the medications affect all of these hormones because all of these are hormones, and uh, are used in different ways to manage the blood pressure. So I'll just go through very quickly. Um, the liver producing a particular hormone, which then goes 
which is broken down by another hormone released by the kidney, goes to the lungs, and an enzyme there converts it to another hormone, which acts on the adrenals. The adrenals produce adre um, aldosterone. Aldosterone makes your arteries constrict and so increases blood pressure. The hormone released by the kidney causes um, sodium and water retention. You retain water and salt and you increase your blood pressure. Aldosterone acts on the kidney to do that. Now, this is very important because this system is what determines which ethnic groups are more likely to develop the blood pressure and which drugs work better in which ethnic groups as well. So just look at this. And when we are looking at the drugs, then I'll be using some of these terms. So this system is what goes awry in primary hypertension. When we find no cause, it means that this system of hormones and new hormones being produced, something has gone awry there. And we try to use medication to modify how this system works. Next. So what are the symptoms? Most important, you can have high blood pressure for years without any symptoms, even when severe. So you can have severe hypertension no symptoms whatsoever but when you do get symptoms these are the symptoms headache persistent blurred vision nausea and vomiting dizziness chest pain shortness of breath quite often if you present with nausea and vomiting and chest pain as a hypertensive you're in a hypertensive crisis and you're at high risk of sudden death so it's very important to have your annual checks. However, what I am been seeing more and more is symptoms like this in people in their 40s. And in the last year, I've had quite a few um, women and men in their 40s. And in one particular case, a 42-year-old man who was already in kidney failure and was partially blind as a result of hypertension that had not been picked up before. Next. So do I have hypertension? Um, this is just a slide showing for people who actually have high blood pressure now how to properly manage your blood pressure. So blood pressure, when we measure blood pressure, we get two readings, a top number, which is the systolic, which measures the pressure in the artery after your heart contracts and beats. So it's that pushing out. And the diastolic measures the pressure in the artery between beats when the heart is relaxed before it contracts. People often ask me or come and tell me, Doc, my top number was high, but my bottom is low. Or my bottom is high, it's not as important. That's not true. Both numbers are equally important. So you can have a high top and a normal low, and you are hypertensive. You just have systolic hypertension. And then you can have both high or you can have actually your bottom high and the top um, normal. So when you're measuring your blood pressure, it's important to sit for about five minutes before you do your blood pressure, both feet flat on the ground, um, try not to talk, bring your arm up to heart level, um, your left arm, preferably at home, even though you might see us in the office measure left or right, which we can. We look for certain things between left and right. If you are measuring at home, left hand on bare skin, not over your shirt or anything, sit upright, feet flat, blood pressure is monitored, measured twice a day, 12 hours apart, not more than 13 hours apart, because blood pressure is what we call circadian. It goes according to a rhythm. It, peaks and troughs at different times, and we need to know for patients when their high is and when their low is. It's not the same for everybody, so that we can adjust when is the best time to take the medication. So in the initial, if you are first diagnosed, or if you change your medication, we advise twice a day um, for seven days to 14 days, and after that, you can measure blood pressure like you know, twice, three times a week once you're controlled. Next. So is my blood pressure normal? So uh, these are the values for normal blood pressure, 120 or less. 
um, 180, um, 80, sorry, or less diastolic. Um, as a doctor, we get concerned when the blood pressure is less than 90 over 50, or it gets to 90 over 50. Sometimes patients get concerned when it's under 120 over, you know, under 180. We don't get particularly concerned unless you have symptoms. So blood pressure is elevated between 120, 29, a systolic, and then we have stage one, stage two, and hypertensive crisis or stage three, when your blood pressure is greater than 180 and or the diastolic greater than 120. So I had one of these cases last week. Patient came in for a food badge. I took his blood pressure. It was 180 over 10. So I thought something was wrong with my machine and he has no history of hypertension, mid 40s. He had no clue, no symptoms whatsoever. And we struggled to get it down, but we did. Um, many people again will tell me, well, doc, pressure is okay, you know. It's about 138 over 90 over 85. That is hypertension. A normal blood pressure, and when we've gotten stricter, it's 120 over 80. It's modified for age, and that is a discussion to have with your doctor. Next. So what is the management of hypertension? It's a lifestyle disease. Main management is always lifestyle. The management of hypertension very much like diabetes and all the chronic illnesses depend on you. I can't stress this enough. How important it is to take advice. If a doctor tells you, listen, your blood pressure a little high, don't wait until three years later you come in on a hypertensive crisis. A little high means he has seen that you're possibly at stage one hypertension, you're hypertensive. Importantly, the main things, diet, exercise. If there's obesity, weight loss. As you lose weight, blood pressure falls you limit your salt and caffeine intake. If we went back to the original slide, there was a little bit there with sodium, which is salt. Salt is sodium chloride. Sodium plays a big part in that whole cycle. Um, so you limit your salt. Caffeine, because it causes your heart to race and there are certain chemicals there, caffeine can raise your blood pressure. Stop smoking. Smoking destroys your blood vessels and deposits toxins along along the walls of your blood vessels and into your lungs. Reduce your alcohol consumption. Next. Diet is always my go-to for all of the communicable, um, non-communicable diseases. Diet is most important. The DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension, um, is a diet developed, you know, over many years, 20, 25 years ago, looking at various foods, how they affect um, your, your body, how they modify weight loss, the effect of sodium on the body. So one of the main things is a low sodium diet um, with foods high in, put, rich in potassium. I would say you don't want it. You don't want to now go and just have high potassium foods because any change in electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, too high or too low can cause heart attack, um, heart to stop, or can cause arrhythmias, which means abnormal rhythms of the heart. So a plant-based, grain-based diet is most effective if we're having meat, a lean meat um, diet with fish intake. We need fat in our diet because fat is needed, cholesterol is needed for proper working of your brain and for um, your other organs, but it's the type of fat that is used. And it's not necessarily, I'm talking about low fat, I'm talking about good fat. So we come to medication. And the different medications, some of y'all who are hypertensive might recognize some of these um, medications. So the diuretics, 
which are the thiazides, they remove extra fluid from the body so that the heart doesn't have to pump extra fluid and is not pumping against large volumes of fluid. ACE inhibitors, this was um, one of the hormones where the ACE enzyme change one hormone to the next hormone as it went through the lungs and we try to inhibit that enzyme from making hormones that affect that whole system um, that leads to the sodium retention and um, issues with the kidneys so these are tend to be kidney protective the prills enalopril perindopril isinopril calcium channel blockers these work again in the heart they remodel the heart and they also work um, within the artery walls so nifedipine amlodipine angiotensin renin blockers these are some of the words again that we saw working at the level of the kidney blocking the release of that enzyme or hormone which then prevent it's a cascade so once we block one we prevent that cascade from happening so Diovan, Aprovel, Atacan, these are the Sartans, Valsartan, Herbisartan, Candesartan, beta blockers. A lot of people be familiar with their Tenalol and Coreg and so. These, there are these little um, receptors called beta receptors all through the body, in the blood vessels and in the heart. They are also alpha receptors. Um, they can dilate, help, you know, open up your blood vessels. The beta blockers also help control the functioning of your heart. So it controls the rate at, at which your heart beats and it controls the contraction of your heart. Then we have central actin agents like methyl dopa, which we don't use as much, but we do use it in severe hypertensives. They work at the level of the brain. And we have the aldosterone inhibitors. If you remember, those the aldosterone was one of the hormones. Aldoctone is one of the drugs that we use there. And again, I wanted to just go through medications that raise your blood pressure. We mentioned some, um, the remembering that some of the medications, not just about drinking coffee, but some of the medication like Panadol Ultra, for example, has caffeine. Some supplements which purport to give people a boost on energy, caffeine and ginseng are the stimulants added whenever you see vitamins or stimulants or things being sold to you that can give you a boost with ginseng or caffeine don't take them one especially if you're hypertensive i have seen people with severe hypertension um, uh, working out in the gym i had a bodybuilder and the ginseng was raising his blood pressure quite high um, Anti-inflammatories like Divon and Advil. Constant repeated use of um, Advil, Divon, Ibuprofen, these anti-inflammatories cause kidney disease, acute kidney failure and hypertension. So modify those short courses. Some antidepressants, discuss with your doctor. Stimulants for people and young people who have ADD, ADDH attention deficit disorder and autism and so may sometimes use be prescribed ritalin concerta or, or their amphetamine type drugs that are used for obesity all can raise your blood pressure and again the illegal drugs for example cocaine and next slide so if we do all that we can to, to control our blood pressure blood sugar and try to live a healthy diet and what does that mean we spoke about a lot of things in that that you know that I, I I haven't been I haven't been able to expand on then we live long healthy lives with with hopefully with our partners and that's that's it so any questions <laughs> a lot wow. Of questions, but yes. wow Nicola wow so much information and yes you have quite a number of questions so i'm going to quickly hand you over to reni who will moderate our q a good morning thank you Arja. thank you so much dr alcolo yes lots of information and we have lots of questions 
Our first question this morning is from Andrea. For the menopausal woman, would you recommend the taking of estrogen to assist with the management of high blood pressure? That is actually a, a morning lecture <laughs> because the use of estrogen, which is hormone replacement therapy in menopause, has to be used very cautiously. So in women who still have their wombs, we do not advise the use of hormone replacement therapy or estrogen. It causes a buildup of the lining of the womb and it can um, result in the long term changes to the womb which can lead to cancer later on. So we don't. If you've had a hysterectomy and that is part of the reason why you've gone into menopause and HRT is fine. Um, Technically, we do use um, HRT in some older women who are having problems, but not with high blood pressure. You can use certain ones under strict supervision at a strict dose um, in menopause for the relief of symptoms, certain symptoms, which on their own can cause hypertension. But, you know, I'm very cautious here because that is strictly under doctor supervision. So HRT is not used in the management of high blood pressure. Um, I hope that answers the question. But it is a topic that is very relevant um, because, again, there are different types of estrogen. There are plant-based estrogens. Um, there are things that have estrogen-like effects in some menopause medication. So my answer to you today would have to be no as in estrogen to manage hypertension. But it's a discussion to have further. Yeah, that's, that's the best that I could answer there. I don't want any misunderstanding mis um, with regard to that question at all for women. Okay, no problem. Thank you for that thorough response. Our next question is from Eric. Are there cases where blood is leaking through the artery and it can be treated without surgery? What is the difference between aneurysm and blood leaking? Yeah, no, an aneurysm quite often causes leakage. So when I was um, discussing aneurysms, many times, unfortunately, the only time we know when somebody has had an aneurysm, ooh, the only time we know when somebody has had an aneurysm is when it suddenly ruptures and, and the patient dies. But you can have leaking of the aneurysm um, in the brain and somebody may be presenting with chronic headaches, for example. Um, you can have um, what we call a dissecting aneurysm where that aneurysm tears. Because an aneurysm is like a big balloon um, in the heart, in the artery. So there's a little tear and blood starts to leak and you have extreme, you know, intense chest pain or you, you start having heart symptoms. And if we catch it at the time where you are leaking, we can put meshes in, you know, kind of like a patch, we're gonna sew it in and to stop the leaking. Um, in some cases we clip in the brain, we clip the aneurysm out or now there's special surgery where we put certain coils in the aneurysm, etc. you know, it, those are the surgical aspects. So you can have a leaking aneurysm and then you can have the full ruptured aneurysm. So hope, hopefully that answers the question. So if you have a leaking aneurysm, you can't manage that with um, medication. That is surgical because then you, then you have blood leaking out into your body. So you, you need to put a patch in. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question, what is rec what is a recommended blood pressure machine to purchase? They often offer an arm or wrist. Is there a difference? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. I, um, most doctors, we advocate um, an arm blood pressure. 
especially as you get older, because the further you go from your heart, your have your blood flow changes. So your blood flow to your hands, for example, blood flow to your feet, the blood flow is um, less and the blood pressure can be different, especially in age as the arteries get smaller, they get um, atherosclerotic. A young person may get away with doing the blood pressure. The rest, you can do your blood pressure almost at any artery once you know how to place it, etc. But I don't advise it for the older patient. And when we're taking the blood pressure, whether left or right, at the level of your heart, then we are getting that pressure gradient across your heart. And what we actually do when we're measuring blood pressure is that we are constricting the artery. So there's a big artery going through the arm called the brachial artery. You constrict it, stopping the blood flow, and then it slowly releases and we measure the pressure gradient across when we release that blood pressure. So you want to do it on like a large blood vessel, which is your brachial blood vessel. And uh, uh, oh, a good brand. There are many different um, uh, uh, brands. If I'm using a home brand, and we use it in office too, the Omron um, brand, but you need to follow the instructions and don't take your blood pressure like 30 seconds apart because you're going to get abnormal, um, you know, you're going to get an abnormal picture of what your blood pressure is like. So you need to sit, you take it once, you sit, you take it again three minutes later. And so the Omron brand is a good brand. The other brand, the important thing is that you're using it on the arm. Okay, thank you. Moving on to our next question. What would you consider to be a normal pressure and a high pressure? I know you went through this earlier. If you could repeat it again. Yeah, that slide, we probably went through it a little quickly. So a normal blood pressure and, you know, interestingly, um, within the past couple of years, the guidelines have got more aggressive um, and we are sticking with a normal blood pressure of 120 over 80. That's a normal blood pressure. Saying that, however, normal can be different for different people so younger a young younger teenage girl may have a blood pressure of 100 over 60 and that's normal for them but the point is it's less than 120 over 80 so that's fine um between 120 to 130 top and 80 to 85 is what most doctors would accept at one you know but we would point out to the patient that that is early hypertension and we may, won't give you medication per se unless you know there's some overriding factor then diet and exercise to keep your blood pressure lower and as you get older we do accept slightly higher readings um i wouldn't go more than 140 over 90 but the truth is in some of the much older patients, if you try to get the blood pressure down too low, then they get symptoms. They can't tolerate the blood pressure, you know, even at what we would say is a normal in a young person, the 120 over 80. So we'll accept for a, a, an older person, um, and I mean, you know, in their 80s, a slightly higher blood pressure. Thank you so much. Our next question here. Oh, sorry, here. Uh, before we go on, I'm always considered uh -huh. High, um, and uh, again, for me, that is going to depend on when you present. So if you mm -hmm. come in your 20s and your particular blood pressure, as opposed to when you're in your 40s or 50s at a particular blood pressure. So if, a, if let's say, a 25-year-old a comes and they're persistently 135, 90, that's a warning sign for a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old, or even at 130, 85, they should be normal. And if you're persistently 140 over 90 or above, you're definitely hypertensive. So that's high. You don't want to get into a crisis where it's, you know, so high that you start to get symptomatic. Then, you know, you've had damage um, occur already once blood pressures are that high. Sorry, I just wanted to say that. Okay, no problem. That actually answers the next question. 
about the age, if age affects the blood pressure reading. So I can move on then to the next question. I do not have hypertension. However, when my blood pressure is being taken, I get anxious. Wondering if I will have a high reading. Will this affect the reading? Yes, there's that phenomenon called white coat hypertension. And that's why many doctors actually don't wear white coats in the office because the white coat for many people is a trigger. You know, you see a white coat and immediately doctor, nurse, somebody going to give me an injection, whatever. You know, that was, those are the thoughts that come and blood pressure goes up. So when um, I see um, blood pressure, a high blood pressure reading in a patient who does not have high blood pressure, I quite often will ask them to do that blood pressure monitoring that we discussed twice a day for a week to 10 days at home for me to see what the blood pressure is like. However, there are little technicalities there because there's blood pressure at home called masking of hypertension where you can actually have normal blood pressures at home and actually have hypertension. So it's a little tricky, but white coat hypertension is a thing. I have many patients with white coat and they, I always have to tell them, listen, bring your, you know, blood pressure readings with me, with you, um, so that I will know that, you know, the blood pressure is actually okay. Uh, so yeah, white coat hypertension is important. So the answer is yes, you can have a high blood pressure, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're hypertensive. But if you see that happening in the office, check your blood pressure every so often, just to make sure that you're actually staying normal. Because what could be happening is that you are spiking during times of stress. Because people often think, well, oh gosh, I was under stress, so my blood pressure is high, it will go down. That's not accurate. Um, what's the word? in sort of every so often um times of stress doesn't cause high blood pressure chronic stress which is different can cause high blood pressure and um you know extreme stress death of a spouse or a child or people going through divorce and so but just Today was a stressful day, you know, my pressure was high and I noticed I'm, I have a lot of stress for the past month and my pressure is high. Quite likely you have high blood pressure, so you need to check it. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you provide normal weight ranges? That's our next question. Uh, not off the top of my head because weight is a factor of... Um, your gender, male or female, height, age. Um, I can give you some ideas. So let's say somebody, let, let's go like somebody like myself. I am 5'3". My weight should be and I'm small frame. This goes also according to your frame. So I'm a I'm a small frame. So my weight, for example, should be about 120, 125 maximum for a small frame. Somebody who is 5'3 but a large frame, larger hips and shoulders and 130, 135, they may carry and not have a problem age as well so somebody at 20 as opposed to a woman who's going through menopause menopause another thing about menopause we don't like is that you gain weight quite often so that an older woman i don't expect for example um a woman at 55 who is 53 to be what i was at 25 i was 105 if you are 105 at 55, you're going to look sick. So it, it's difficult to, to tell somebody what they should be unless I'm working with you in an office because I have to see your frame, I have to see your age, I have to see your height, all of that. Um, so the best thing is to get the weight charts, which you can get online. It gives a broad idea, um, but it does, they don't always take into account age and frame but they have to take into account gender. 
So that's not an easy question to just answer. But you know, if you talk with your doctor, um, then measuring your, your height and so on, look, uh, they'll be able to give you a better idea of where you should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, this next person is saying, well, they're asking if you could email the dash diet slide because it wasn't easy to read. Yeah, yeah. And actually, on that slide, I made sure and put the put the um, website. Oh, the source, um, okay. Yeah, which is actually pretty good. Um, I think that source was in the, I believe in the Mayo Clinic website. I took because the Mayo Clinic does, um, you know, it's very useful for um, the layman, for patients, a lot of good information. And I think it was that site where um, the DASH diet was discussed in detail and there are different forms of the DASH diet. So. What I can do is pass that on to Audra when I, when I have a look at the slide later. OK, no problem. All right, our next question here, which is a better recommendation between Narvac and nephedepine tablets for mild high blood pressure? Right. <laughs> so Norvask is amlodipine. Mm -hmm. um, Norvask, remember all these are just brand names. So the drug is amlodipine. So as I had shown up there, I know again, we did it quickly, the calcium channel blockers, the nifedipine and amlodipine, are two of the calcium channel blockers that are the most commonly used. Um, no real difference, no, I should say no real difference. It, again, it, it, it depends on the patient. Some people may respond better to amlodipine some to nifedipine. There's a slow release nifedipine, which people respond very well to. The calcium channel blockers are, are pretty good, pretty effective at managing high blood pressure. Um, so I wouldn't say either one is better. What I would say is that Novask is very expensive. You can get cheaper versions of the amlodipine that is not as expensive, but generic. They are, they are good generics brand kind of like branded generics um and it's just a matter of figuring out which one will work for you but i have to say because we didn't get a chance to explore this is that different medications also work better according to your ethnicity and that is a, a topic of great importance because the caribbean latin america is largely a brown uh, a brown um region you know, black, dark, <coughs> um, black and brown, largely, because all our mixtures in between is brown. And as a result, the calcium channel blockers and the diuretics work best, in particular in people who have Afro, um, Afro genes. It has been found that the calcium channel blockers and the diuretics work best. Um, so it's also a conversation to have with your doctor when you are put on a medication as to your ethnic mix, ethnic background, etc. And you may find that we may start you on one medication and it just does not work for you. And we put you on something else and it works fantastically. And, you, and that is quite often um, genetics and, and ethnicity. So that on its own is a very interesting topic. So if that person is on Novask, I don't have um, I, I don't have any real um, preference for either. It just depends on how you respond. But uh, one thing with the amlodipine is that it can cause swelling of the feet, mm -hmm. and this is not due to the kidney or anything. It's just one. It's just a side effect of the amlodipine, and some people, you know. That we, they don't like that or, you know, if we see any issues with the kidney, we will change the amlodipine in that case to nifedipine because nifedipine does not cause, um, especially if the calcium channel block is working well for you, then we will switch it to nifedipine. So that's that. Okay. All right, we're running out of time, but I'll just ask this last question. Can you elaborate on the effects of high blood pressure and sexual dysfunction in males? Um, yeah, erectile dysfunction. Uh, so if you think about what's happening again with high blood pressure, um, high blood pressure damages your, your blood vessels and the, spina, the penis is essentially like um, 
a big sponge full of blood vessels. It's just um, loads of blood vessels. And in order to get an erection, though the penis needs to get filled with blood. When the blood vessels have been destroyed or damaged, that mechanism doesn't work. So you, the penis can't be filled with, uh, with blood. And that is how high blood pressure causes erectile dysfunction, you know, very simply put. And when those blood vessels have been damaged enough, then there's nothing that you can do, barring using, you know, the Viagra or Cialis, which can help. They work in different mechanisms and, you know, working with a urologist, their pumps, etc. But as I stated earlier, that no, no, I think I was having a discussion with some of the staff earlier, not on, on the on this group. Um, we can't do anything about it when you wait so long to manage your high blood pressure or diabetes. Many patients come to me and these are often in their 40s and 50s. And the reason the men come at that stage is because they can't have an erection. And by then, as I tell them, you're too late. You might get a little back if the blood pressure is controlled, but it's not often that you get it. You, you don't get it back. On top of that, as I was explaining earlier, um, testosterone in men starts to fall in their 30s and 40s. So the erection starts to get less firm and, you know, you have to concentrate more on on, on on holding the erection to enable penetration and so. So on top of that, as you're getting older, you have testosterone levels falling and then you have uncontrolled hypertension. And uh, yeah, so it's unfortunate because I see many men in their 40s and that's the end of sexual activity for a lifetime unless, you know, you try with Viagra and Cialis and in some cases it doesn't work. Um, as efficiently as it should. Um, and this uh, gravely affects, um, you know, relationships. Uh, and it goes to something I had mentioned earlier, actually, when we looked at some of these studies, a lot of men, um, you know, uh, affected more by the complications of high blood pressure, because for some reason, men believe, you know, a lot of men believe, oh, it can't be happening to them or uh, you know, they could deal with it. Uh, all, all sorts of interesting, you know, reasons I, I get. And I'm very straightforward. The answer is no. You can't deal with it unless you do certain things. And if you want to prevent these things happening, you need to listen to the advice. And if you are ready present with erectile dysfunction, very little that I could do at that point. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Alcala. I'll hand you over now to Audra. Great. Thank you so much, Rene, for your moderating of the Q&A. And Dr. Alcala, once again, thank you. Um, today has certainly been an informative and um, impactful session. And there are so many more questions that, that um, persons have. So I'm thinking what we're going to need to do is invite you back for a part two, where we'll just, questions. <laughs> yes, just focus on have a look Q&A around, um, you know, this topic, you know, because it is such an important topic, you know, that, you know, we, we are interested in exploring this a little further with you. So, we, so again, we just want to, to thank you, you know, for sharing your wealth of information, sharing your time with us. And you know, in doing in preparing for this session today, I was reading that the World Health Organization has a global target of reducing the prevalence of hypertension by 25 percent by 2025. Yeah. And that's a global target, you know. So it's you know, so certainly, and based on what you have shared, you know, um, it's something that we could all play our part. <laughs> Correct. Yes, yes. So we have a responsibility in playing our part, and you've certainly shared some of the things we need to do as well to ensure that that happens. So on behalf of all of us at MLI, I wish to thank you, Dr. Alcala. I wish to thank our technical team and you, our attendees. Um, we do apologize. We know we went over the time, you know, um, but we just wanted this today just to ensure that we got as many of your questions answered. And as stated, we will invite Dr. Alcala back where we'll do some more discussion and, and have some more pure questions and answers around this topic. So please continue to look out for our paid programs or webinars, right? And we want to tell you to please continue to take care of yourself and your families be safe 
and continue to level up. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.